Good evening and welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim and I'm glad everybody's here for order. We are being streamed live on Facebook tonight for the first time. And our speaker tonight is a Rabbi Ben Yosef. Um, the College of Complexes consists of the following format. One, there is one fool at a time, and two, no personal attacks. The format consists of the following. We have a brief announcements period, and our speaker will speak. Then we will have a question and answer period where we ask for questions and not statements because at the end of the question period, you at least have a chance to rebut yourselves at the end of the night. The speaker gets the final word. Let's move. All right. Tonight, we have... I said on there. Okay, All right. Tonight our speaker is Rabbi Michael Ben Yosef and his mission of the Takun Kai International Humanitarian Foundation. And his mission is to be the humanitarian foundation that helps to repair the lives of people all over the world nationally and internationally in a diverse manner. The foundation advocacy is to refuse fascism, mass incorporation, and prison reform, feeding the hungry, police accountability, immigration reform, refugee crisis, climate change, natural disasters, education, humanitarian outreach, social activism, and equality. Let's welcome Rabbi Michael Ben Yosef. In our Hebrew language, we say shalom, and that means peace. Peace be unto you. Shalom Aleichem, most my people. Uh, my name is Rabbi Michael Ben Yosef, president of Takun Kai International. I am the spiritual leader of Remedy Yisrael Congregation in Kenya and in Chicago. I'm here, uh, I, I was given the invitation by Mr. Charles Hodak. Uh, where, where, where's he at? Where's Charles at? Right here. There's Charles. Charles, I want to thank you for this invitation. This is so wonderful. This is my first time ever doing a live presentation in front of a, a group of people, such as this manner. So I, I turned in my uh, bullhorn uh, to sit down and to put a presentation with regards to the work I've done uh, in Chicago and internationally. So I thank you all for having me. Uh, this wonderful gathering that you guys have. Uh, I see you guys eating very well. So this is very good. Amen. Well, I have a presentation I want to give you guys, uh, just to kind of give you uh, just a backdrop, uh, a snapshot of what I do in the community, uh, in Chicago, in Gary, and in, um, um, in India. I'm doing work in India. I'm doing work in Kenya. So there's several things that I've been doing with regards to the things of advocation for humanitarian. So I have this slideshow for you all put together. I hope you guys enjoy it. Uh, I will stop it just to kind of give you some things so you can know what's what. Okay. There we go. Uh, Takun Kai means repair one life at a time. So the world is a huge place. Uh, it's a huge place for us to live in. But however, our objective and our mission is to prepare one life. And that means if one life is repaired, that means a whole generation is repaired. That goes back into the, the concept of Judaism. Uh, here's my Facebook page. This is my Twitter page. So if you guys probably want to write it down, uh, this is my email address. Okay. What does Takum Kai mean? I kind of get an answer, guys. <laughs> well, uh, if you look at the the, the picture, the, the clip art, of the mission of Tukum Kai International is to always be diverse. It's not a one-shot type of, uh, organization, but it's a, it's a diversified community that brings all life-minded people who has a heart, who has, uh, has passion for life, uh, they is interested in making um, uh, things correct in our world. If you notice, there's a little uh, a little uh, letter in the in, in that in, in between there. That means Kai. That is the center of our. No, I'm gonna read to you guys. You guys just have a good time to eat. Um, the Hebrew letters in the middle of those all those hands is Kai. All of us has a life, and life is precious. 
So we put, I put that Kai sign in between of all the hands to signify that we all have a place in this world. And that's what Tukum Kai International stands for. Okay, can you that? Tukum Kai means repair, Kai means life. Uh, the foundation slogan means repairing one life at a time. Okay, there's a little circle here. Tukum Kai's mission. Uh, he kind of gave us a little preview. Leadership, justice, education, and advocacy. So these are the four cornerstones of what Tukum Kai International stands for. All of these four corners around the globe. And if you notice, the circle is designed specifically, meaning the world. That's why it's international. It does not have the reach only in Chicago or in the United States. It has a reach in Kenya, in India, uh, South America, uh, Nigeria, all over the world is where our reach is. So there's nowhere that the justice and the in injustice or education and leadership that we cannot uh, reach. It's all about advocation. Tonight's topic we're going to examine police brutality, unsolved murders of black women, 75,000 missing in, in the United States alone, nationwide, gun violence, and then the last one, wrongful convictions. So I chose these topics, as you heard earlier, I have several things I advocate for, but if we have all the things I advocate for, we'll be all night. So I just pick the, the key ones I really strongly feel strong about. This is Alton uh, Sterling. Alton Sterling was murdered in Louisiana, Baton Rouge. As you notice the picture, he was, no, he was murdered July 5th, 2016. By a 30, 30, 36, 37 year old um, when he was murdered. And if you look at the clip art, um, it was an altercation between him and the police. Um, and there was a, uh, there was a, a conversation between the two and the officer uh, gave him orders and, and Mr. Sterling wanted to still have this conversation. But the, the, the racism issue in, in the world that we are living in uh, doesn't look at the people of color in the matter of, of looking at them as human beings, more so. So uh, this, uh, the result, end result was that Mr. Sterling lost his life because of the fact that this officer uh, saw only someone who he wanted to racially cleanse. And unfortunately, uh, Alton Sterling lost his life four years ago. Um, this is a clip art uh, uh, today. Um, Colin Kaepernick. I, I always look at him as, as a symbol of, of the struggle that we're trying to advocate for, which is police brutality. Now, Colin Kaepernick uh, made a stand with regards to the national anthem that's being recited in the United States in NFL uh, um, um, football seasons. However, uh, Colin Kaepernick today has went this in uh, Atlanta, Georgia, right now, seeking to be. Uh, to reinstate himself and to be a quarterback in the NFL. However, I put this clip part in here before uh, for a reason to show the, the, the issues that is going forth about where the flag is being used as a symbol to what it is, which is not the case. The issue of what he's advocating for is the police brutality, not for the flag. So a lot of times the uh, racism tries to hide and tries to uh, cloudy the information to make us be misled, it was not about the flag. So I want to make this be uh, educational tools to, so we can see the reasons why he took a knee. Because if we look at the history of America, it has been very much of uh, the uh, racial cleansing of the African people for over 400 years. So he saw fit to advocate for this issue because of the injustice that's happened to people of color being murdered. And I put over here, uh, on the corner there, 814 shootings have been done by the police alone this year. Uh, black men and black boys are 25 uh, uh, times more likely uh, to be killed uh, during an encounter with the police. Um, now I also have one there. Uh, one of one a thousand black men or black boys will be murdered by the police. So that statistic is very telling because of the fact of how dangerous, uh, I call it more like 
uh, the black men are endangered species because of that figure. Because of the fact that we have to constantly deal with the racial profiling, dealing with uh, being targeted while we're going in the streets, while we're walking, uh, coming home from uh, uh, coming from work or parking in our cars. So these are the things that Colin Kaepernick really stood for, up for with regards to this issue. And I put a link there uh, for where the, I found this study at. Let's see. This is Atalia Jefferson. She was murdered just recently. Uh, she was murdered in the corner right here. This girl right here. She was murdered uh, by by. Um, she was murdered in in um, Texas, Fort Worth, Texas, just recently. I put this picture in the corner there uh, to show you how women are really mistreated, uh, women of color, just as men is. Um, the reason why they do that, uh, we don't know, but there's a reason why they grab their hair. There's many pictures of black people, I found just one of them, of showing the disrespect of pulling with black women's hair. Um, so they, they, that's what, pretty much what they do when it comes to that. 31 black women uh, will die in police brutality already. Uh, this, this young boy just, re gotta go over here. This young man was uh, murdered in San Antonio. He was murdered in San Antonio, um, an officer in San Antonio, unarmed man. Uh, he was murdered uh, by um, Officer Stephen Kosnova uh, in 2018, so just recently. So there's many situations in certain different circumstances uh, where young boys and uh, young ages are being uh, racially profiled and being uh, murdered. Uh, now I'm going, to, I'm going to the next thing here, next topic is the unsolved murders. Uh, women of color murder. This is one of my key issues that I really advocate for. If you notice that many times on Facebook you see many women missing, you see it in the news where women are, are uh, found in body bags and garbage cans. Uh, I took on this issue since uh, maybe like eight, ten months because I've been seeing a, a great epidemic of this issue. So I took on this issue because of this issue, the, the, the murders and no one's advocating for this. Uh, the, the media hasn't said anything. Uh, this is not a topic in discussion in the cycle of the media. Uh, because I took this on, now we've seen more of the media taking it onto, uh, as a part of their news cycle. Um, I have many, uh, I will say maybe maybe 12 different actions I've done on this issue. I'm getting ready to launch a new initiative to take this to Congress uh, to get legislation done with regards to having more investigations and bring more appropriations to this discovery of, of the information. Um, as you notice, I have this little sign up there. I'm, I'm on the street, I think this, I'm at, uh, I recognize that. I'm at the African Festival. So what I do is I choose different locations where I feel a vast amount of people will be at. So I go out and hold my sign. I hold that sign, it's a very popular sign, by the way, because of the fact it's so direct, I don't have to say anything and you can read it. Um, in the corner that you see it says Chicago serial killer on the loose, 51 plus women murdered. When I had that, that banner, it's actually a banner maybe like uh, five by eight. Uh, when I had that banner made, uh, I was given, given a call by one of my colleagues and said, oh Rabbi, you, you get this banner in, in production, right? We just found out there's actually more than 51. So to avoid this banner being destroyed, I had the, the printer to put plus. <laughs> So it's actually 75 plus murdered in Chicago alone. Um, you, the, the, the serial killer that we, we're advocating is in most our community has been in existence since 2001. So if you think about, this is 2019, right? So that's over eight, almost 19, 20 years that this has been going on and no one seems to have any raise or any advocation for this or an investigation with regards to this. If, if do, do they think it's all done by the same guy? See, that's the question. We don't know that. Well, what about the uh, similar <coughs> of the ways the women are killed? Uh, well, that's a great question. We have what is called the Murder Accountability Project, uh, which is done by Mr. Uh, Thomas Mahagrove. 
he is a he is like a um, organization that that has uh, brings forth evidence that's been log log logged in the database of the police. So what he does is he looks and calculates everything of what the police reports in, in on the on each report and then does a study. Uh, the Murder Accountability Project says that these murders are happening the same way consistently. Uh, the the signs of a serial killer in the community is either being strangulation or body parts being dismembered or stolen, or found in the garbage can, or behind abandoned buildings. And the Chicago is notorious for having abandoned buildings, which is why I went to City Hall uh, to advocate that Mayor Lightfoot uh, uh, close down or even rehab these abandoned buildings, because that's a safe haven for a killer to do his work and to dump bodies away. Because he doesn't want to carry bodies around the street, he wants to dump in closest area you can find. So yeah. we have to think of like a, a serial killer, so to, so to speak, to, to, to limit his opportunities to what he does. So, however, um, I went to my life with maybe two, three times on this issue. The first time, uh, she did not want to hear what I had to say about this. I actually talked to her and I said, uh, I had to ask her for our undivided attention twice uh, about this issue. Um, she was more interested in taking notes and talking to her colleagues. So I said, no, I need your undivided attention about this. The second time, I actually went before her, and uh, Eddie Johnson was there. Was, this was when uh, October 23rd. You can go to the city clerk uh, or on the website of, the, of Chicago, um, and you will see in 223 where I actually talked to her personally. Uh, well, not personally, but on, on public speaking time. I said to her that we have over $95 billion that is sitting in a, in a trust uh, for the police academy that's being proposed by the outgoing mayor, Rahm Emanuel. And I said to her that we need to reappropriate that funds to bring forth in using that money either to rehab the abandoned buildings or uh, either uh, try to put forth uh, money towards these detectives because there's no one detecting this, this, these issues or even investigating. Uh, you have like detectives that are like, you know, looking out to like they are in the last uh, pension time, you know, ready to retire. So we need fresh ideas, fresh, uh, fresh uh, views, and fresh ways of uh, investigating, which we're yeah. advocating for. So this issue alone goes further than that. It goes further into Gary. We found two bodies in Gary as well. Um, just recently, two, maybe a week and a half ago, there was a body found on the street in Gary, Indiana, which is another sign there's a serial killer on the loose. So again, the scope of my work, by advocating for this, by doing many press conferences, by appearing in public about this issue, so now the serial killer, I believe, has been watching my work uh, on, on TV and finding different ways to getting the murders done. Because of the fact, how I know the murders are being watched is because in Riverdale is the most significant one that's the latest one in Chicago or in the suburbs. All the serial killer work has been in Chicago. That's why you see Chicago serial killer. The latest one in Riverdale was found in Riverdale, in the suburbs. So that tells me, gives me a signal that my work is being watched by the serial killer in, in Chicago. Uh, because it, it's always been in Chicago. Uh, here, Sandra Davis, she was murdered. Her body parts were missing. Fingers were cut off and some of her body parts were removed. I put a link, News 1. Um, you can, Take a snapshot if you want to look at the research on it. Chicago has been almost a year and half, a year and a half since Tanya Moore's only daughter, Chinatia Smith, was found dead in a garbage can not far from a west side home. So again, the target of the serial killer is on the west side and in the south side. So um, that's what we find in, more so in the, in the, according to the Murder Accountability Project, that these murders are happening there. So now on the north side, now, it's more so in areas where women who are like more low-income families or are really like poor. So that's the target of the serial killer. Or they, they're not really, they're disposable. They're, they're not, no one's going to really care about them. Um, the key parts, strangling, body parts, missing, disposed, and alleys and garbage cans. These facts are found, like I said, it's supported by the Murder Accountability Project. And this is a website I've provided for your information if you need to do any further research. Uh, here is another, here's some clip parts of myself actually in public to show that how I'm really uh, positioned to this work um, internationally or nationally. I'm at a press conference here at City Hall 
uh, Fox Chicago News took a picture of me and, and kind of talked about just a little, it's a serial killer in Chicago, 51 men, women murdered by strangulation since 2001. You know, in the corner there, I'm, the other clip bar just, I think it's from ABC News, just getting a little information about uh, my work there. And 75,000, that's important because that's nat nationwide. So uh, you're seeing right now uh, a lot of girls, a lot of, a lot of kids are being just, just found missing, missing or just missing from nowhere. So I, I've been um, going to uh, uh, circus, Universal Circus. I was there like five weeks in a row. I literally seen maybe over 45,000 people pass me by having this banner out there. I've been passing literature out just to kind of get the word out because of the fact Eddie Johnson, Mayor Lightfoot, is not really interested in bringing forth this on the public service announcement. Uh, I believe more so why they're not doing that is to prevent, uh, to deter, or to, de to prevent any tourists from not coming to Chicago because they want to bring more tourist money into, sh into the city. Here's the circus right there I was talking about. So I, was at the, I took a clip art picture of the circus and I put my banner up this. Yeah, right there, up there. On, on in front of the interest I mean, there, so I got I got very good exposure. Uh, a lot of people came up to me about this. Even the circus said, "Well, Rabbi, we saw you out here every week. Why don't you come and talk to us, and we'll schedule a time for you to be inside the tent next time." So it's, again, it's all about pressuring and, and continuous advocacy that I believe change can make a difference. Where so, is that tent? Uh, this was in, in, in Washington Park. Just recently, they just closed down uh, the, the circus like two oh. weeks ago. Over in the corner there, I did a vigil. Uh, WBBM saw me on the street. They did a story on the women of color murdered. So they, they, I'm holding my sign up there. That, that's very, like I said, a very popular uh, picture um, that everyone likes to see. All right, I'm going to go to gun violence. Right. Um, you guys have been seeing gun violence uh, like on your news every week, every day, every weekend. You see 15, 15 20 shootings and five fatalities. I advocate for this issue because of the fact uh, we have a problem epidemic in our community with regards to gun violence. Really, the issue is, is key. Economic development is what's missing. We don't need more police. We don't need more uh, monitoring. We don't need the Army. We don't need you know, the National Guard. What we need is economic development. That's the problem, or programs for these young boys. Because if you seen just recently, maybe, uh, maybe five months ago, you saw children go downtown and, and, and wander downtown, just mopping downtown on Mount Nancy Mile. The reason why they did that is because they have nothing to do. So my, my, my uh, advocacy for this is for the city, that $95 million that's sitting out for, instead of a police academy, take that money and bring more uh, after-school programs or making mentoring programs where young men can have some programs to give them, to show them ideas of how to make themselves be productive and to be positive role models in this city. Good idea. Um, so there's there's a there's a need, but there needs to be something for them to have. Over 300,000 blacks were killed uh, in 35 years. That's a staggering statistic. statistic. Um, so I got it. If you want to take a snapshot of that, I got the link there. I had a clip on, but it's not there. In Chicago, 451 people have been killed this year. 2,000. 394 shootings in one city. That's only Chicago. You're not not including Baltimore. You're not including uh, Darman. You're not including Gary. Yes. Shouldn't we have a strong program of stopping? Um, let's go. Let's take the questions at the end of the speech. We need to train our policemen better. You're trying not to have the academy. We need more training. Training for these cops. Okay. Yeah. Uh, all right. Again, it's reminded that we speak. Then there's questions, and then there's a. Uh, a chance to rebut, please. Okay. Uh, then we have here um, the homicide rate right now. If you're not following the statistics, I follow the homicide rate. Uh, right now, it's currently 9.5 percent clearance rate. What does that mean? It means that if you are murdered, if you're wandering the streets, just going about your day, you have a 90 percent chance of your killer being get get away. So that's the statistic right now in Chicago. Uh, I did a press conference at the city, uh, at the Chicago Police uh, Headquarters uh, to advocate that, uh, that the forensics, which is also backlog right now, over 6,000 cases, meaning that 
of the budget is under budget and under man, the Illinois State Police are under budget. So that contributes, because when the police officer does his report, it's like feeding the meter. You have to feed the meter to, get what you need to keep your car parked. Well, if you open up a, uh, a case, in court, in, when it comes to the database in, in the police department, you have to feed that meter with the information and close the case out. Well, right now, over 6,000 cases are open right now to this day and more and growing. So these cases are out there, including the 75 women of color murdered and missing. So all of these cases there, that's why the, the percentage is so low. Nationally, the percentage, uh, uh, the uh, clearance rate nationally is 62%. So that tells you absolutely something's wrong with the system where it comes to the uh, lack of uh, investigations, uh, when it comes to uh, uh, the public not cooperating, that's a problem. We, we have to admit that. There's a problem where, you know, some approval or be not being a snitch uh, to the people not bringing forth information to the police so these murders can be solved. But still, at this point right now, uh, Chicago is the most surveillance city in the whole United States. Every, uh, every um, light pole has a camera. So I use this example to show how swift that the city of Chicago, the police department, can be and solve these murders uh, with regard to our community. And I find it very, almost hypocrisy to say that they can't solve them because uh, during the time of Lollapalooza, if you remember the time of Lollapalooza, there was a car full of guns. There was gentlemen that came into Chicago the same day, weekend, that uh, the mass shooting in Daytona, uh, Texas, and El no, El Paso, Texas, and Dayton, Dayton, Ohio, the mass shooting. That same weekend, there was, a, there was going to be a third mass shooting in Chicago, combined with uh, all the other mass shootings. The city of Chicago apprehended that vehicle that had a car full of guns, semi-automatics, rifle-style automatic weapons, all kind of ammunition. That car was apprehended so swiftly that weekend because of the fact a lot of Palooza brings forth millions of people downtown Chicago. So I challenge the city of Chicago and Mayor Lightfoot of their hypocrisy <coughs> to bring that 9.5% clearance rate up because of the fact they were so swift to bring in that one car out of all the cars in Chicago, found that one car and brought it to justice. And they went to court. And they went to jail. So I find it a bit of hypocrisy that that 9.5% clearance rate is so low. Meaning that in Chicago, the, the city of color, the zip code matters where that percentage is less, as opposed in other districts where uh, other races, ethnicities, they go up. So that's why I challenge and stand before Mayor Lightfoot to advocate why that number and that number is at, the, at a minimum as it is. All right, I got here. Uh, by, I just took an example one weekend. This is kind of just uh, a, how one weekend looks. Five fatal, 60 shoot, three shootings during the 4th of July. That was one of the most deadly shootings that we have seen in recent memory this past summer. Uh, so to challenge that, I, I kind of gave that a little earlier. I said bring economic development. What does that mean? All of the abandoned buildings shows uh, these game bangers that's in our community. Ah, I got somewhere I can just do my business. This is my territory. Well, if you change the mindset of how these people, individuals operate, by bringing something that's positive, that gives them something to do, uh, bring forth programs, then that, would, that can change the mindset of where they want to do bad, instead of doing bad, but they want to do good. Because there's something to do that's positive, which we don't have in Chicago. You have more abandoned buildings, you have uh, high grass, weeds everywhere, you have uh, big trunks that's sitting out there that looks like a, like, like a haunted house type of environment. It, it does not give anyone the, the feeling, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of my community. So if it's looking like that, it contributes to the gun violence. It contributes to the mindset and the behavior that we're seeing. I believe that economic development is a source of bringing more of, of a change as opposed to bringing more police academies. Because we, when you bring too many police academies in the community, it only makes uh, the people who are there going after to be more, to feel more threatened. That's, I'm speaking from an example. I personally have been targeted by police. I personally have had a situation where I've been uh, a gun has been put on me by a, uh, a police officer. It doesn't make me feel 
um, more connected to the officer. It makes you feel more like, well, I want to do something different. Well, so I took my anger into using it into act, uh, social activism, taking that situation to social activism. But that's not the mindset of most people. They look at it as a retaliation. Uh, retaliation to say, oh, you're not with us, you're, you're against us. But see, that I have a different perspective. I'm gonna change, take my anger into a matter of positive reinforcement to bring something better to the community. You see, so that's, that's why I'm saying uh, to, to put, and then to put that police academy in the heart, the heart of, of where the poor people are at, is even more slap of the face to the people of color because then you're murdering them, so then you're gonna put something in that community that this, this will be more of a, 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 a flagpole to say I'm gonna train the officers to murder you. So it's more like, it's not helping, it's more hindering the progress we're trying to make, which is making and bringing our people more to resolution and to give them better ideas and things to how to live. So that, so I'm, I, I kind of answer your question now, but I'll get to you later, okay? So here we got, uh, I said, we well, have these buildings, $95 million are sitting out there, the middle life foot can do just that. Um, I have several ideas about these better bills, several ideas. I mean, there's, there's drug prevention programs, there's, uh, um, Children who are after school who needs to have some sort of uh, physical education. You don't see PE in the schools. I'm thinking about when I was a ch child. We don't have those things now. So these kids are running around the streets, and this is raising the numbers of what we have in our community. Wrongful convictions. Now, I did an action. Um, I have a very soft, uh, a soft spot for the, the, the prison, the criminal system, because of the fact uh, this is an issue that um, consistently happens in our community uh, where you've seen in the television someone served, served, served time for 23 years uh, of something they didn't commit, but they were forced to, to say, hey, I'm going to get less time to, um, to get less time, so I'm going to go ahead and plead guilty to this. But really, actuality, they are innocent. Uh, several cases have been that that we have seen where our people have been subjected to that type of thing. And this is why I feel very strong about this initiative that I advocate for, because right on the corner there, that's standing next to me, that's Mr. Dre Norman. He served time for a crime he did not commit. He served time he did not commit. So his life is lost. His life is, uh, is he's an older man now. He was in Chicago, and he was in Chicago uh, to, to seek clemency because he wants to, he wants to uh, uh, go to school. Because it's, what, it's only his record, he cannot go to school. See, he's trying to do better. The system is preventing progress, not adding progress. So it's kind of it's kind of productive to have something in their record uh, to allow them to do to add to society. I think we want him to add to society because if he's went through all of what he went through, he wants to contribute. So uh, my thing is, why hold him back? Why not give him the tools and what's necessity, <coughs> and what's necessary to give him uh, things that he can go forward and make a better life, and even use what happened to him to inspire others. See, it's a it's about it's a teachable moment that can happen uh, with those kids that I'm talking about. He can be a mentor to provide something to those kids, but he's he's held up. He's not able to do that. So right now, he was in Chicago just like maybe a month ago. Um, he went before the board of the uh, that. Uh, sends the approval to the, the governor uh, to get it be, uh, to clemency to be awarded to him. So it's still uh, going right now. So this was actual uh, clip art while I was recording in, in like right here. I was recording it uh, in, inside the actual uh, room where he was at. Um, right next to him is Miss Tarice Johnson. She's a good friend of mine. She's in, in Atlanta, Georgia. His attorney right there is next to him. That's an innocent project. The Innocent Project is an organization uh, it's in the United States. Uh, they advocate for cases where you're totally innocent. They have, a, they have a strict guideline that you must show every ounce of innocence in your case for them to take, on, take you on. And they took him, his case on in this case. So right now he's, he's taking the oath. He's going to be plead before this, this, this panel and tell his story. It was a very moving story. Um, he was talking about uh, how he changed and how um, how this, this, this affected his life and what he wants to do to his community in, in Atlanta, Georgia. He's also a social activist in Atlanta, Georgia, but he can't do too much because of the fact he is not able to do what he can do with, with his, uh, on his record. Uh, this is the most recent one. This is Rodney Reed. 
I advocate for him. He's also uh, has his case uh, to be uh, looked at with the uh, Innocent Project. As you can see there, there's Dr. Phil. Recognize him, right? Well, anyway, Dr. Phil actually took him on his show. There's been several celebrities around the country. There's been many activists, many religious leaders, many uh, politicians, even law enforcement. Even law enforcement is advocating for him. He's innocent of all the charges. Here, uh, law enforcement, I'm just kind of say that. Law enforcement, celebrities, community activists, religious leaders, uh, all support uh, Mr. Lee. Over three million petitions were signed on his behalf. Uh, right over here in the corner there was a letter written by the state representative from, uh, for Texas. She even wrote a letter on his behalf. So this is showing you how damaging our system is by putting someone, and he's actually on death row right now. He's on death row. Yes, he's on death row. You know, uh, Abbott just okay. extended his Let's wait until... Yeah, I'm, yeah I'm, I'm about to get One to that. He, is, uh, he, was, uh, he was actually to be executed on November 5th. Uh, what happened was, uh, his first stay was denied by the Court of Appeals. Um, the Attorney General, uh, the uh, judges in that district and the, and the prosecutors did not want to look at the evidence that was coming out, the new evidence, because of the fact Again, it's about racial cleansing of our people. It's about um, targeting individuals who they have on record that they want to racially cleanse. They want to execute the same pattern of what America has been for, the same pattern back during the time of the civil rights movement and earlier times in that time, where people like Emmett Till were murdered and, and, uh, and, and victimized for the fact that something he didn't commit. This is the same example of that type of situation. So uh, a lot of times people say, well, America has grown, or America is great. Or, but if you look at the issues in our history, uh, this doesn't show us great. It shows us uh, in the same manner of those times because of the fact you want to racially cleanse someone who has proven himself, even with uh, clear evidence of not being guilty of all charges. Now, this is another key example of showing how clear his, his, his case is of being innocent. As I told you earlier, uh, the Innocent Project has only one criteria. You must show every ounce of innocence of everything in your case for them to take your case. They don't take very many cases. You have to be absolutely sure everything that you have must meet every criteria. This case met that criteria. Uh, we asked questions like... What was his charge? Uh, murder. He was charged with murder. I was trying to get, get into what all state? Texas. Let me, I'm, I'm, let me get one second now. Uh, the murder charge, he was charged is in Texas, in Austin, Texas. Um, he was, 20 some years ago, he had a relationship with a woman who was married. However, uh, it was um, perceived as being a rape charge and she was murdered. But she was murdered by someone else, not by Mr. Reed. So uh, he was charged, Mr. Reed went to court and was convicted. Uh, the murder weapon was not. I want to get to my next part here. Uh, this is this is it's kind of flipped. Uh, but anyway, uh, Mr. Reed was convicted, but he pleaded not guilty. All his uh, all was charged against him. I don't know what the counts was, but the main the main count was. Uh, that's how show show how severe it was. He was on the death row. Uh, so um, right here, this yesterday, um, there was a. There was a, um, a previous vigil overnight. Uh, that was the 14th, I believe. The family was at SCOTUS uh, Supreme Court. Uh, I was actually downtown Chicago at 2:30 Dearborn, and we were doing a simultaneous vigil, uh, vigil for for Mr. Reed. Uh, I fasted that day, so what I did was I, I, I didn't eat. So in, in the Jewish community, what we do is when we really want to pray, we don't eat because that's the best time of praying. So I, I return back to my teachings of how my community goes and my in the tradition of our community of fasting for something we really, really want the Almighty to, uh, to, to bring into fruition. And just what happened, um, the next day we got this message here. Uh, I saved the actual link, I saved the actual script that he wrote, and I put the time and how many minutes it took. This is what it was. It said breaking news, update. Uh, we did it. 
the Texas Board of Pardons uh, Parole has just unanimously recommended a 120-day reprieve. We love you all. Happy tears are flowing. And then Mr. Reed uh, signed it himself and he sent it out. And I kind of put it over there just a little bit as well. This, if you can think about the agony of this family, uh, when you are on the verge of being murdered without something you didn't do, uh, we can sit here in a seat and pretend like we do know, but it's a different story when, when you're walking the walk. Uh, he had to endure uh, this week to be racially cleansed, uh, to have the hours tick away. And this all happened that the Almighty saw fit and, and showed mercy upon him uh, to allow this great news upon his family, his mother, who has been uh, a champion for 22 years, 22 years of agony. Um, and she still did not give up. See, uh, this is another thing of, if you don't have any faith or any uh, belief in God or I don't know what your faith is, but prayer, if you are really serious about uh, how you want to go about and get changed, put those prayers up. This is a good example of showing that anything is possible if you are really prayerful and believe. So I kind of put here some, the 10 things that this project, this innocent project, would only would only take his case on to prove these are the keys that make him that make him innocent. And why the Supreme Court had to overturn this and had to say we need to give him a 120 day extra to prove his case because of the fact it would not be enough time for all the new evidence to come forth and be put in. Uh, number one, the weapon, the forensics was not even checked. So uh, that's a key, it is a, a, a thing that, that, uh, that needs to be done. It wasn't checked on purpose, we believe, because of the fact of the racial cleansing of Texas. Uh, we just also seen uh, Golden Jean was murdered by a police officer. We just saw Joshua Brown murdered. We also seen um, uh, 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 Atalia Jefferson was also murdered uh, by a police officer. So here, these are the examples we're showing, the consistent patterns of racial cleansing of our people. So these are the things I advocate for of the things that must be brought to uh, brought into uh, the community and of the large. Uh, the state's forensic admitted records were of errors. We have a government official that's supposed to be the one that's being paid by the government. They admit that they, they have done errors on his case. So you can't can't murder someone uh, to do a, to, uh, electrocution or even lethal injection with these errors pending on someone's life. Three, uh, two medical doctors confirmed that it's impossible medically or scientifically to put him on the case of this murder. These are doctors who are professional, professionals that does the, does the work and to advocate and to uh, know the, the science behind everything that goes with regards to these, uh, the forensics. And they confirm there is no way possible to link into that. Uh, Reed, Reed and Sykes had consensual relations. So this is where I said to you earlier about the question you had. Uh, it was a, um, a consensual relationship between uh, the deceased and Mr. Reed. And there's a third party involved, and we're going to get to that in a second. Jimmy Fennell, this is him. Jimmy Fennell was the prime suspect. So somehow, it went off with him and went on to Mr. Reed. So they needed a scapegoat to allow him to be the victim and to go through 22 years on death row and allow this other guy to just sit here and have free sky free. Okay, number six. Sheriffs reveal Fennel gave inconsistent accounts of the murder. So here we, again, we have law enforcement who are doing the right thing. Now see, not so often have we seen that law enforcement will come up and be on our behalf. So I find it very significant that we see law enforcement will come out to make this sort of statement. So this does have to raise the eyebrow or the suspicion that this court of Supreme Court must do the right thing and did the right thing. Two witnesses has come forward and signed an affidavit of new evidence. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> About Mr. Fender's involvement. 
number eight, Fennel had previous history of violence against women. So he's a womanizer. He's a womanizer. Uh, number nine, this case was racially charged. And then number 10, the confession by Fennel has come to light. So he confessed of murdering this individual that Mr. Reed is being charged for. So here are the 10 keys of showing Mr. Reed being innocent in a court of law and should be exonerated swiftly. And he must and should be a, a given apology uh, from the Texas uh, officials. He should be a given apology from every official that has charged him. He should have every ounce of being able to serve uh, and to, and to uh, get whatever uh, uh, remedies or any pain and suffering that has happened to him. He should have every ounce and everyone should be, uh, should uh, welcome everything that should come to his way because he deserves, uh, his life was turned upside down for something he did not do. And that will conclude our, our discussion or our right. uh, presentation. Okay. Now we're going to open up to questions. Yes, we'll open up the questions next. Do you want a moderator? Do you want to just want to? Okay, uh, start. So, okay, what's your, any, what's your name again? Yes, hi, I'm Ellen Corley. Hi, Ellen, how you doing? Yes, I'm, I'm actually real involved in the Alliance Against Racist Political Repression and uh, Civilian Police Accountability Council okay. and um, especially against police uh, torture. And um, But I guess since they want me to do questions, um, what do you think about prosecution? Uh, you didn't name the prosecutor there, but I. Um, uh, well, I which think case? We which need, case? Um, with the Fennel Reed, um, oh, okay. Rodney Reed. Yes. You know, I think we need to. Um, I just read a book about this police state. There's a lot written on this, but I, is that? I think we should organize to do a way to prosecute. Question? And I, do you know anything about this prosecute? The prosecutors are the, um, and. And the police, you know, uh, they don't seem to get prosecuted. Uh, so we need to encourage that. Um, that's a very good point. Um, I didn't deliberately leave that out. It's more like the slide had to get, get done. And, uh, mm -hmm. uh, but that's correct. Uh, the prosecutor needs to be held accountable and all those who are responsible for putting Mr. Reed through this uh, terrible nightmare. Um, mm -hmm. Just remember, this is a life that was going to be taken in just a minute of days. Uh, I don't know if any one of us can even phantom of the years of pain and agony that this individual was unnecessarily put through. That's the, what I'm talking about of how our people are just victimized and terrorized. Uh, the strength that he's showing and mm -hmm. showing during, during his press conferences and during uh, being interviewed by Mr. Do uh, Dr. Phil is amazing. Even just, just a couple days ago, he was interviewed by Gail, uh, Gail a friend of uh, Oprah Winfrey. Um, so mm -hmm. it's just a matter of poise and, and just uh, owning the moment. Because if you know you didn't do nothing, you had nothing to worry about. So that's just, just a testament. Of, uh, of that, uh, what he has shown, and I agree. When it comes to the accountability, uh, COPA, um, I really have no faith in COPA. I will be doing an initiative against them. Actually, in this uh, upcoming next police accountability minute meeting, that's gonna be scheduled with the announcing of the new uh, uh, interim uh, police uh, superintendent, Mr. Charlie Beck who is responsible for LA's race, race riots. Mm -hmm. He's also responsible for being involved to being uh, uh, as one of the, the, the past elect to Mr. Rodney King. Mm -hmm. So I will be at COPA mm -hmm. at the Police Accountability Project, uh, Police Accountability meeting mm -hmm. and uh, denouncing his uh, announced, uh, of, of being a part of the uh, police department and also COPA as well because they have shown themselves of having uh, several instances of being uh, uh, just lack of errors, of many errors, of not following mm -hmm. through with their, their, their having their agenda, even following, not following through in their own language. Uh, it goes further than that. I will be also denouncing uh, Mr. Kevin Graham, who is also a racist, uh, who is uh, the president of, uh, of the Fraternal FOP. Uh, so I'll be uh, doing a, a, just a, a, a getting my bowling ball and doing a, a complete strike all at one time. 
uh, during this, this meeting that will be happening, uh, I believe, next week. Uh, so I will be having a press conference there uh, at the Chicago headquarters uh, to make that to be uh, uh, very much so. So I'm on top of this work. Uh, when it comes to the police department and those officials who are in, supposed to be uh, advocating and leading in righteousness and in integrity. Uh, I just did a uh, press conference when it comes to the, the release of the Kwame McDonald's uh, uh, report. Uh, every murder, if you all know, has a report uh, that is generated by the Inspector General. I was at the police uh, headquarters when that report of Laquan McDonald was released. I did, uh, I was, I denounced that report because it showed clear example of how the cover-up, there was over 16 people that did this cover-up, even key ranking officials. So you're, we are paying for someone to cover up these type of instances. And I find it a bit of hypocrisy that you're going to tell these young boys who you're policing to follow the rules, but you, sitting with the badge, sitting with the gun, and sitting behind a desk is going to come and tell these individuals to follow the rules, but you can't even follow the rules your own self. Next question, please. Okay, uh, David. I think she had it. She had it. She was next. Well, I was wondering, um, actually, I, I don't have a question. Sorry. Oh, uh, okay. I, I'm, I'm so involved in wrongful convictions. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yes. Ah. Uh, what do you advocate doing to remedy uh, gun violence? Um, I, I, in my slide, I, 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 I was very adamant about economic development. I believe when you take programs from the community and leave them uh, inadequately su uh, sufficient, you have a, a, a ticking time bomb ready to happen. It's almost like um, when you have a dog, you train that dog, and he's a, he's a rock well on me. I don't know what type of dogs you all have at home. But if you train that dog and he, he gets a loose, what does he do? He wanders around, right? Until he finds someone that's going to take him in. Well, that's how my people are right now. They're wandering the streets, have nothing to do, no one's doing anything for them. So now we have these schools uh, that's just uh, having these kids running around like wild animals, not giving them any bit of. of programs or any uh, goals to achieve or any uh, any mentors like in the community to stand and bring these individuals or getting funding like my my my, my, my uh, organization funding I can bring these programs into Chicago uh, open up and bringing like uh, 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 gymnast opportunities or maybe job training opportunities or even trades those are the type of things that are needed to, to curb the appetite of wanting to do bad and to want to pull a gun or giving them something to do in the community who also remedy the old situation. Not to bring a police academy into the community. That doesn't remedy it. It only enhances more of the disconnect, only enhances more of, just of, of the, uh, the belief that no one cares, and only enhances uh, more of doing mischief as, instead of doing things of, uh, positive and bring contribution to the community. Next question, please. Okay, next. All right. You have now. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. Please go ahead. Uh, uh, twofold. Yes, go ahead. Uh, how much uh, what, what's your name, please, ma'am? Janice. Janice, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Um, I understand <coughs> the going rate for kids sitting, or the young kids out there selling drugs on the streets, like 75 bucks a day, and they don't get any uh, vacation time. Is that pretty much the, what, you're, what you believe or has it has a value has it gone up? Well, the, the murder rate is 9.5. You talking about the murder rate? No, I'm talking about the kids that are out in the corner selling drugs. Right. Yeah. What, well, what, how much are they making a day? I don't, I, I couldn't even, I couldn't even, I don't, I don't sell drugs now. Well, you know, the, the whole point is when you're talking about all these programs and how much money you're going to spend uh, giving yeah. these people skills, is what are they going to do after they get all these skills? Because there aren't any jobs. Well, I mean, again, the, the hold, hold on, hold on. If you if, if you if you have an organization like myself, I'm an organization. Uh, Provided me with the with the with the resources, I will create a job. I create jobs. You're just going to give money to people for doing nothing? Bunch of the class? Uh, no, no. Well, uh, we will put do? them to work. We will put doing them. what? Excellent. Well, uh, again, trades, uh, oh, lawnmower, uh, repair. Yeah, shoveling you, snow. Or advocating. The lawn, Come on. Uh, you put them to school. You give them, uh, uh, get them, put them to school. You mm -hmm. give them uh, uh, yeah. several things. When, when you, when, let me tell you this. When we have that negative idea, 
you'll never get hit. It's not a You always have to have a positive attitude. My, my question, or at least the way it looks to me, is that a lot of the young people today don't want to work because they don't want to do these dirty, menial jobs. Well, I, I beg to differ with that. The people I, I work with, uh, I work with people, the gang bangers in the streets. I work with uh, uh, young men who are uh, just you know, want to change. I work with uh, uh, housing. With, like, it's like uh, people who come back to the system. They are very motivated to come in to do do uh, better. Uh, but the thing is, when there's nothing to do, it's very it's it's almost like this. let me tell you the, the mindset of how someone come out the system. When they've been down for like 15, 20 years. Okay. Are you Charlie coming out of prison? P prison? Charlie. He, all, that's, that's the same area. It's all the same area. That's the same area. No, I mean, these, these kids haven't even gone to prison yet. They're just... I mean, they're, well, it's, they're the same, recruited. it's the same mindset, man. They're recruited right out of great school. Can we agree? Can we agree that's the same mindset? Because if you look at someone on the street, they're criminal, right? If they're doing criminal work, that's not that's not serving the community. That's not bringing positivity to the community. That's only making it worse. Because they're doing, you what are they doing to make that, that drug deal? They're putting someone's life yeah, on, on, uh, in, in someone's hands and, and bringing fear and bring, uh, bringing their guns, their big guns, and if the bad deal goes down, they shoot someone. Well, to change that mindset, put programs that's going to give them something to do. That means uh, we, sit them, we sit down and find, look at the geographics. Look at what's, what's missing, what's not, uh, what's missing, what needs to be added. Uh, when there's a will, there's a way. In my opinion, there's a will, there's a way. Um, you have so many, I see so many programs, like for example, um, you have like uh, uh, construction jobs right now that's going, you know, all over the place. I, I, I know people like that, construction workers. There are yeah, hospitals. There, I mean, there's so many. When we say there's no there's jobs out here, okay, okay. you just got to go out there and find You tapped on a good, a good point. And, and I mean, I live in an area where I see this going on. I'm not just talking about, I don't live on the drive for God's sake. Right. Okay, so so there's a lot of vacant buildings in the city. You could take these kids. Absolutely. In, you could give them a class, teach them how to do some building skills, and then put them to work and, and rehab that building. That's why I say and about the $95 share, million dollars I stood before Mayor Lightfoot and is, said, take that money from this initiative that Rahm Emanuel signed and all of the uh, the city council official agreed to have, which is a, was another time bomb, uh, take that money and reprogram it to initiatives that's going to enhance and make the community better. That's what I'm advocating for. Because when you don't take, when you take that money and it's put it, I mean, look, if someone murders, I don't know if you all have anyone that's been murdering your family ever. Yes, yes, I have someone I have. that's murdering your family, like myself. I have. When you know that's happening to your family, do you really feel really good after that has happened? You have a you have that in the back of your mind that like, man, if you you may not want to act on those emotions, but it's in the back of your mind, hey, if I ever had a chance, I want to get revenge. But you don't think that, you don't act it out because you know the consequences. However, that's not the mindset of these individuals in the okay, Chicago. Okay, I'll get it, I'll get it. Uh, the mindset is to do retaliation and to do mischief and to do more harm. We want to change that mindset by putting, again, that money to use, making it work for us. I want to add to Okay, and then okay, we'll go to the next person. Go ahead. The point is, we, we have a system in Chicago. Let's save it for the rebuttals. Uh, next Let's question. Let's ask questions. Next question. So no, in order to somebody do, else have a chance. One second. Next question. In order to do what you want to do, make it work, number one, you have to make sure the people on the top are getting the money oh. and actually trickles down to the people who are doing the Absolutely. work. And you have to bypass all the union regulations and also the building codes. Yeah, no otherwise, doubt. otherwise you've got layers and layers and layers that are never going to get through. All right, no, let's say, okay. Oh, okay. Next question. Next question. Yeah. Next question. Yeah. Next question. Yeah. Next question. Okay, so what's your name, sir? George. 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 Okay, George has a floor. Do, do, do you think yeah. that blacks oh, commit uh, well, we violent crimes, so many violent crimes, is because they come from tough, violent neighborhoods? What about this guy who hit this guy with his helmet? What do you think of that situation? Okay, Merrick, you have two questions there. I'm going to ask a simple question first. The helmet issue where, that you saw on, on, on national television, um, look, that's violent. That's violent. I don't condone that. And that's not the way how we should conduct ourselves as professionals. 
uh, we have to rem be reminded that we have little children that's watching us, and we are their role models. So we have to show ourselves uh, uh, capable and worthy of giving them something to gravitate to and to you know to show how to uh, diffuse or to make ourselves uh, seem more responsible in that situation, even on television. Uh, to your your first question, the reason why you see so much violence is because. If you, my, my major, let me tell you what my major is, I, I need to tell this. I, my major is psychology and child development. A lot of times people don't like to talk about the child development as a cornerstone of the issue. You have to look at the family as where the, the source of the problem because you don't, if you don't look at the source, that, that, that is the, the clear evidence of how the, the, the later uh, response of what is the wrong issue, what you're doing wrong in, as an adult. If you have a father that's not at home, if you have more abuse in the home, if you see, uh, if you if you only see violence in the home, if you uh, if you see only uh, anger, nothing that's nurturing, because if you remind, if you remind, we're told in psychology that at as uh, age of five and under, uh, that child mind is like a sponge. So everything they they they're, they're engaged with, if they see more violence. That, their minds are not programmed like we are. We're, all, we're adults. That mind is still uh, in the stage of maturing, and that mind is uh, gathering all of that data, that negative data, and somehow the wiring in that mind, that cognitive, is all screwed up. So then when you have that child grow up, has all of that thinking, that wiring is incorrect, and they act. That's why you see children in school. They have like uh, they act up in school, or maybe they, they get kicked out of school, or uh, like um, being a being a bully, or uh, someone that's very quiet. They end up like you had the shootings a couple of days ago. Those are the type of things that the wiring of the child. It starts when in it starts in the home, and it starts when a child is at a young age. When you see these issues. Go ahead. What's your name, sir? Oh, Charles. Charles. Yeah. Oh. Michael, uh, looking over your various projects, oh, man. Thank you, wouldn't, sir. wouldn't very commendable, but wouldn't uh, absolute and total gun control be the solution to the problems you outlined of the violence against women and convictions and incarcerations? So you have to eliminate weapons from your community. Um, well, this is, that's, um, I, I'm, I, I mean, all the other stuff, unless you do that, isn't going to really, it's just kind of like peripheral. Well, this, let me explain this, Mr. Charles. Uh, if we all understand, a lot of people don't understand and know this, uh, the guns that are distributed in Chicago is given by the police. That's not being told or even advocated for in the media. If you understand what's behind the scenes, Chicago is the most uh, distribu distribu distributed gun population in any area in Chicago. It's distributed on these freight trains. We don't have any uh, any any uh, uh, gun shops. We don't have any anywhere to make these guns. So how do we get these guns? We get these guns from the freight trains, and the police are giving these guns to our people. And you have and they and they're giving these guns. To our people, so then they begin to do racial cleansing that way. So those semi-automatics, we don't have no way of getting that. We don't have any airplanes. We don't have any ships. We don't have any of that stuff. But it's coming to our community somehow. Think about it. How to get in our community? These semi-automatic weapons. Where's the evidence of this? Where, where is the evidence of this? Yeah. Well, the freight trains only come to the south side of Chicago. You can look it up. It does not go into any other air district or any other area other than the south side of Chicago where the murders are happening. Okay. All right. They did to get a video of that. Now, you, know, um, you have now a black woman mayor. Yes, sir. A black woman county on, on the thing. And you also have several black women and men in the school board. Mm-hmm. Now, are you trying to tell me that there's still racial injustice or can you guys now, being in charge, handle the situation? Well, this is the thing. Uh, that's a very good question. That's an excellent question. Let me tell you why. What's your name again? Tim. Tim, Tim. That's an excellent question. Let me tell you why I, I don't don't ever think it's going to work. Even if they look like me, does not make it better. I'm going to be very honest. It needs to be me 
their ill, then it will be better. That's the problem. The city has and hires the same individuals that's a part of the system. They only interest in making themselves uh, the political gains of what we're seeing. It's always been that way, even my people who are the same one doing the same thing. If it's me on that board, advocate, you will get the results. They don't get they don't they don't want me on that board. They don't want me to be the one that runs the city. They don't want me to be the one to distribute the money about what it's supposed to be because they don't want me there. Uh, I have uh, my Facebook family out there understands and know that my Facebook is always shut down because I'm always radical about what I, my approach and very strict and unapologetic about what I say because of the fact of the issues I stand on. The uncompromising and the cut, the direct message I give is only about what's supposed to be said. And you're not going to get that out of Mayor Lightfoot, you're not going to get that out of Eddie Johnson, and you're definitely not going to get in, out of any politician that looks like me in, that, in those jobs. Only way you're going to get that is if I'm running it. Okay, we got one right here. Uh, okay, what's in it for the prosecutors? Why are they doing all of this work? It would be easier to catch the real bad guys. Well, they don't want to. They, again, the playbook is consistent. The racial cleansing has been the problem uh, since the, the racism has been in existence in, in, in America. Uh, the message about how to racially cleanse us is by allowing the murders to consistently happen, put the, uh, the different disparities into the community as far as guns, uh, you have drugs, all these different things, and then when you want to have a prosecutor who's supposed to do his job under oath and being uh, uh, under the Bar Association, that's only a smoke screen because the only thing they want to do is put more of our people in the prisons as opposed to uh, define just and put the right guys, the, wrong, the ones who are doing the wrong, in behind the bars. But they want to always put like our, man, our brother here, Roddy Reed, behind bars, who has, is very innocent, or like my man uh, Dre uh, Norman, behind bars, who did not commit the crimes, but want to keep the ones who are doing the crimes on the street to continue the racial yeah. cleansing of our people that way. All right. Are there any more questions? Yes, you are Oh, yeah. all right. I know this guy right here. <laughs> By the way. All right. Just to the subject slightly, what are you doing in India? Oh, so yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, I have a network. Uh, a network that I believe that is reaching all over the country, all over the world. Uh, so what I do is I have uh, different people who, who I give as admins to my uh, network, and I give them more so like uh, the uh, the uh, the name of the Kung Kung International and put uh, whoever the area the they are uh, representing. So Where India is, is about one uh, one billion people. He, so he there's someone there is the actually with the baby studying. And they're leaving uh, they're not supposed to say it, but she's studying to be a rabbi right now. Uh, so I've been really counseling her and advocating for her to stand and be the, the spokesman uh, for truth and righteousness there. So what I mean with my work there is more like focusing on the, on the concerns that are, that are pending there. There's a lot of injustice there as well. Uh, as opposed to Kenya, I have a congregation in Kenya, so I'm networking there. I'll be going there possibly this year coming up. Uh, I'll be meeting with the president of Kenya, and I'll be meeting with the governor and the senators there uh, to uh, instill this community as a viable community. Uh, there will be a high celebration. I will be bringing the media with me as well uh, when I go there. I'll be probably doing like weddings and uh, written me laws and doing certain ceremonies there while I'm there. But mainly my purpose there is to instill that, uh, ensure that the government treats the community uh, in high regard because of the fact uh, we see in so many other racial cleansing over there in that area as well, particularly in Israel. Uh, you, we've seen uh, Solomon Tinka. I'll be going to Israel as well. Uh, um, advocating for the murder of Salam Tika, who was murdered uh, by police. The same way I, it goes on here, uh, I'll be going to the United Nations to advocate that the uh, Israel be uh, given sanctions because of their measure of having racial cleansing and discrimination against the Ethiopian Jews. So when I say I'm really uh, a person of word and of truth, I stand on that because the scriptures tells us twice, justice, justice you shall pursue. All right. Meaning, you cannot just be blind to the issues that face you. You cannot sit and allow things to percolate when lives are being uh, being taken 
uh, taken. You cannot sit and just be silent. You cannot just pretend as if it's going to take care of itself. There's a requirement by the Almighty that we initiate and to be focused on the issues, in particular in Israel, uh, when it comes to racial cleansing and discrimination of the Ethiopian Jews. What about BDS? Are you going to do you, you have boycott, divest, sanction, and the way they're cleansing the Palestinians? Really uh, that's a very good question. I'm, I'm very, uh, I, I've been, um, on both sides, when it comes to the, the conflict in the region. Um, the reason why there's a conflict is because there's no one communicating. I would love to be the mediator between those people, uh, the between the Palestinians and the Israelis. Oh, my mic came out. Give a second. I would love to be the mediator between those two, uh, but the thing is, um, the two-state solution is my, my initiative and my advocation for uh, to make both heads and both uh, to go to the corners and cool off. Um, the world is the Lord's. And I think if the, the world is the Lord, we are sojourners here. Um, so in other words, we have to uh, be mindful and be loving of each other, to show respect to each other, uh, to look at each other as human beings, that you look, I look like you, you look like me, you have a heart, I have a heart, you have a soul, you have a soul. Uh, when you look at on that level, um, the levels of hatred that comes out of both sides, both sides are guilty. Uh, then, then when we recognize and get past that, then I believe there could be a solution. I, was gonna buy it less. Um, I just believe in in working towards that goal and not uh, just closing the door on opportunities mm -hmm. like that. But um, when it comes to one does the other, uh, I just I, I, I did notice. Uh, um, that um, Israel was attacked by uh, by Hamas. I'm not very happy with that. But Israel did something I'm very pleased to announce. It, it, it continued to offer aid to the Palestinians, regardless of the uh, attack about ha ha Hamas to Israel. But still, there still needs to be more uh, a conversation with that group. Okay. Okay. Do, do, do you think that the Superintendent Johnson leave, is uh, giving promotions to detectives not on merit. He even give, uh, he gave three women girlfriends uh, lieutenant raises, you know, uh, promotions. But I, I'm wondering why this, uh, these detectives are so, uh, get such a low clearance rate. Well, I, I don't know the process and how that all works in, in, in behind the scenes. Um, look, I'm, I'm, I'm very clear about transparency. If the department has a, a, a method how they do business, it should be public to the people, and then the people decide. I believe the power of the people should have the voice and the one to make the decisions. I believe that if any decision that should be made, we should be the one to give the final resolution to Ohio goes. Uh, but again, um, when you have different people who rise up to new ranks, I mean, it does look suspicious, I agree. Uh, but again, I can't really, you know, comment on what the process is. But I believe they should reform that. Their life for should reform that to give that res uh, that uh, responsibility to the people to decide who should be able uh, to fill those spots and show themselves worthy with the experience and have uh, uh, a resume with uh, with experience with that. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, last so question. Yeah. We're gonna go to rebuttals. To Ellen. Get into the. To, you know, the Judea tradition as opposed to Christian or, or something else. So. Oh, we're going to ask that? Okay. Um, all right. There is a long history. I was a Christian. I don't know why, by the way. I was a Christian. I uh, grew up as a Baptist, uh, a home of Baptist, one church. However, um, I, was searching, I was searching for the Spirit for the connection to the Almighty. Uh, I met my, my wife. Uh, we do a divorce right now. However, um, we we met and she was a Jew. And I was a Christian. So it was one day we had a conversation and I had a, a pole sausage. <laughs> Believe it or not, it was a pole sausage. You had what? A pole sausage, a sandwich. Okay. So I was eating a sandwich. She was sitting there. A pork sandwich. Pork right. sandwich. Yeah. And she said to me. He was eating pork. She said to me, um, you're, "You're not supposed to eat that." I said, "Huh? I'm not supposed to eat what?" 
<laughs> with this? And she said, yeah. All right. And I said, well, I'm, I'm going to eat anyway. <laughs> uh, so then I took a bite out of it. She got mad, <laughs> very mad. And I said, and, she, and her voice changed. It was, it was more like I could feel the anger, but was passion behind it. And I began to think, if she really has that amount of, of conviction behind it, it must mean something. That was the start of my searching. Okay. Um, so I began to study. And I began to, uh, they, they invited me to one of their leaders, of uh, their synagogues in Harvey. Uh, my first teacher, his name is El Shikna Ben Levi Ben Israel. Uh, we had a meeting together. Uh, he sat down with me, kind of talked to me about certain things. But I was still searching. I didn't know, really know what's what. So one day, there was like, uh, I was like just reading at home. And, and then the uh, next day, it was Shabbat. I came to her house, her house. I said, I'm ready to go to Shabbat. That's what Saturday. The day of rest, the day of worship for the Almighty, according to Exodus chapter 20. Um, so then the family was like, oh, you ready to go to Shabbat? So they started from there. But I was more hungry for knowledge. Okay. I was more thirsty. It says in the scripture, come ye who are thirsty. Meaning, the thirst of an understanding of what the Almighty wants for our people. So I began to go further study, deep study, and I met my second teacher. His name is Kevin Fenier. He's our chief rabbi of, of in Chicago. Um, in 97, I met him, and I said to him, something he said to me in the back of my mind, he's going to teach you one day. In 2004, I entered the academy, in the Rhythmical Academy for the Israelite Academy in Chicago, which is one of the oldest academies in the whole United States. It started in 1918, one of the oldest academies you have, like, uh, uh, you, um, yeah, uh, Jay, yeah, you can't be with all of them, but it's a whole lot of them. But anyway, long story short, he taught me all that I know about how to do this work, about my advocacy, and about the knowledge that I have right now. So it was a, it was a trial step of okay. getting to this point. At this point, we're going to have to cut off the rest of the questioning because we want to go to rebuttals. Mm -hmm. Let us thank our speaker tonight. I've been for 20 plus years. All right. Yeah, oh, thank All you. Right. Okay. Now, who's going to, okay, Andy, go ahead and take over. Okay. You're going to be right in the middle of the camera here, so you may want to go right there. Turn this We need this on anymore? Thank you. We got it. All right. Andy, go ahead. Uh, this is a famous rebuttal period. Can we have a show of hands? Raise your hand and keep them up. Whoever wants to uh, say a few words. One, two, three, four. Ten people. Okay. Uh, that means it's about three minutes apiece tonight. So You're we're going to be a little late getting started the rebuttal. So three minutes apiece, everybody. Try to put your thoughts together. And uh, David is first. All right, Mr. Travis. Thank you, Andy. <clears throat> uh, no reflection on uh, the rabbi, but uh, I am tired of hearing the same old answers for the same old problems. The rabbi has been a bit ref on the refreshing side, but I'd like to say why doesn't the rabbi put into his uh, organization a plan to teach inner city slum kids and so forth and felons, previous felons and all of that to learn the proper care and use of firearms. Number one, I, of all the organizations I hear carrying on about the gun violence and gun problems, none of them advocate that. Now, I would also like to mention that uh, one of our people, um, uh, Charlie Paydock, has said that... Uh, what? Gary, Gary, 
please. No, you're serving the program. No, I want, you want the waitress to attention. I'll get the waitress. Uh, as I started to say, I had a big as I started to say, that uh, one of our people here, Charlie Paydock, says, why not just get rid of guns altogether? Yeah. I don't need your assistance, Charlie. Uh, the fact is that uh, that is a, a thing that uh, works. Jerry? That, Jesus Christ Almighty. We've got a problem, guy. I'll just you wait while this gentleman finishes it up. We've got a problem. You might want to help us out with this guy, really. Uh, we're trying to get rid of him, but he won't leave. Well, I'm not sure. He's causing problems on the other side of the restaurant. Not really. Not really. And they have customers left over there. Oh, shit. One guy, we should not let him in. I'm sorry. Well, I'm not understood. <laughs> Can I go on now? Yeah. As I was saying, uh, Charlie Paydock advocated the complete elimination of guns. But that is something that doesn't work. It's been tried and it hasn't worked. Uh, but on the other hand, it does work. It does work if it's not intended to work, if it's a communist solution that says we we want to do this because we want to take away people's rights and the uh, right to bear arms is in our constitution it's part of our bill of rights so it isn't something that can readily be just taken away but if you're a communist and you can get that through on the basis that uh, we want to eliminate gun violence but really we want to eliminate freedom then it would work only too well. So the fact is that that uh, we we uh, the best way to eliminate gun violence is to let people learn the and teach people in our schools, in our high schools, and so on, the proper care and responsible use of firearms. Something that has never been done in Chicago that I know of. Now I'd like to thank you for hearing me, and that's all I have to say. Yeah. Yeah. I'll take the next um, rebuttal tonight because I'd like to get in a few words before uh, you know, while half the crowd is still here. Uh, I agree with the speaker tonight virtually 100% on the concept that there is massive racism in this country. And this last week, if any of you are watching daytime television, the white supremacists and racists came right out of the woodwork and just spewed forth a bunch of hate on national television during the impeachment hearings. <clears throat> Around 1965, the public reached critical mass in this country and said, we don't want to see people hanging in trees anymore. So it was considered after that unacceptable to lynch people. So that has morphed into all kinds of discrimination leading up to today. Uh, with the election of Ronald Reagan in the last 40 years, the racists have been getting more and more confident that you can just discriminate against, especially African American people, all across the board. Redlining, high interest rates, Public, the new public housing is more profitable than the old public housing. The new public housing is for private prisons where the, they have bars on the doors and windows. So you have a massive amount of people in prison keeping them off the streets, right? And it's, this is one of inequality, uh, shoveling money to billionaires uh, and starving the middle class and on down to the poor areas where you have an area where kids come out of school and there's no job prospects other than going into the military and risking getting killed, you're going to have drug dealing and all kinds of other things. But if you look on the other side of it, there's a group of progressives in this country that are talking about remaking America where every able-bodied person can have a decent paying job. If they, you know Anybody that's willing to work and want to work 
just like um, it's a reboot of FDR's program, putting people back to work, especially when it started in 1941. The country took a four-year time out, built billions of tons of plane ships, over 300,000 planes in a few years. And they put people back to work at all levels, and we solved the problem, uh, the, the Hitler problem. But we didn't solve the racist discrimination problem coming out of the war. So there's a, I would encourage anybody, I would encourage anybody to study what the new progressives in Congress are not taking any money. They're not intellectual prostitutes like the other 90% being paid by billionaires to do evil things. We saw this on television where one group is just paid to lie to us. That's why people don't know what's going on in the country. is because people are, billionaires are paying representatives and media people just to flat out lie to us. And we're buried in what I call criminal Sir, insane bullshit. Giant load of cribs has been showered on us all this week. And it's... Si was it uh, the comment that silence means consent? That uh, that that's a last thing I'll say is the Pope came out today and just basically said that silence means consent. If we're silent about the destruction of the planet, uh, we're complicit in it. So coming down from the Pope and some other religions, there uh, the Catholic Church is thinking about making it part of the Vatican. Uh, that that's the one specials. of the major sins is to be involved in the destruction of the environment. If you oppose the Green New Deal and you want to burn fossil fuel everywhere, well, the Catholic Church is going to take a dim view of that from now on. So anyway, uh, anybody who has any questions, come see me in the back at the end. I have a list of information on different things like this. But it's, the country's changing very fast, and there's good things happening, but they're not in the news. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, I think anybody who's been a regular here at the College of Complexes has heard again and again that race and gender discrimination are rampant in the United States. Okay, let me get the other menu. Probably uh, we are not the only ones in the world like that. But it's certainly... Uh, I won't dispute what he said about race and uh, and gender, and those things are very, very important. What I wanted to talk about is just very briefly, the Cock Academy in West Garfield Park. My understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, that Mayor Rahm Emanuel wanted to put $95 million cop academy in West Garfield Park. Where the hell is West Garfield Park? My understanding is the center of it is Madison and Pulaski, if you know where that's at. So uh, I guess he wanted to drop that $95 million in that poor community. Thank you. I was in that community once, and I guess it's quite poor. In any event, he didn't, as far as I know, go to the people of West Garfield Thank Park you. and say, uh, we want to drop uh, 25, $95 million right. in your community. I know you're right. What would you like? Would you like a cop academy? Yeah. Teach your brother. Well, I suspect Teach that you. didn't happen. Teach your brother. I suspect they, Teach your brother. Thank Rahm Emanuel, or people you. behind him, Thank you. Thank you. decided this Thank you. rather than asking the poor people <laughs> of West you. Garfield Park what they wanted. Would you like you some go. schools? Thank you. Would you like uh, parks? Would you like a, an education program? I suspect those things didn't happen. We ought to think about that. Thank you, brother. If that's true, we ought to think about that. Thank you. You need cops. Yes. God bless you, brother. God bless you. So, so tell me, what do you think they do the best you can, Ellen? Okay. Thanks. We I, um, yeah, I'm Ellen schools? Corley. Uh, I'm a big believer in this free speech forum. Uh, uh, training. I think it makes all the difference. Um, yeah, 
Thanks, Jean. Um, that was actually a good intro. I've been thinking, it sounds silly, but uh, I'm a market researcher and thinking if I gave a TED talk, I should say the right to market research. You know, we need to research governments, you know, ask the people what they need, what they don't have, right? And fill those needs. And we do really need a fundamental evidence, you know, to ask them. I used to do it in every other industry and I've come to realize that it's almost a sign of fascism if or you, could you, you can tell they Frankfurt. don't want to know. <laughs> they don't want to know what's really going on. They don't want your opinion. You know? um, I actually proposed the idea to Pritzker, and I keep wanting me to try to follow up with it. But uh, like the you know the police, the problem is they the FOP uh, they throw out the data. They they're. It's, this is evil. It is fascism. Thank you. It's Thank you. that's what um, I've been coming to. While I'm going to give this talk, uh, it just overwhelms me the um, the fact that you know, the media doesn't cover the issues. It's all cover up. You know, the police, the FBI, the the government. They only hire their own. I, you're exactly right. I would go and try to talk to Lori Lightfoot or and. Uh, it's like talking to the Inquisition. You know, you realize she is not listening. You know, you, you can tell her exactly what's wrong. And, um, you know, it, prosecutors, judges, as seeing is believing, you know, watching a judge and a prosecutor and the defense of an innocent guy just wink at each other. Because the, you would wonder, they estimate one third of the people in prison are innocent. And I, I believe that number, it, it makes sense. This was told me by a Loyola lawyer who's working in, for the Exoneration Project and Life After Innocence. And uh, you can't say because they won't let you count. They won't let you come in the schools. Why are they doing it? They're protecting themselves. You know, I've worked with the John Burge torture victims. Um, we, at least 100 have passed the test. They were tortured. Um, you know, but they still get left in jail. And so I've been like you going, why, why, why are they doing this? They're covering for themselves. <laughs> Richard Daly was working with John Burge. And so if, if you, you know, he's only going to, and Lori Lightfoot works for Richard Daly, works for Rahm Emanuel, works for Charlie Paddock, you know, the FBI, whoever. These guys have a, the wall of silence is them just like the fascist was. They, they, you know, killed communists, they killed blacks, they killed poor people, and the reason it keeps going on uh, is because they cover it up. I mean, I, it, they, not a single cop has gone to jail for, they haven't been prosecuted. They're not going to be prosecuted. So you can't make a case. There's billions in victim compensation fund that should go to these people. They should let them out and give them compensation for 30 48 years, my friend was wrongfully convicted. And he tells stories uh, in solitary confinement of being in the black dark. Not just solitary, but black dark. Terrible. You know, but we have to convict them and we need an honest government before we can do that. Next, please. I guess I'm next. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Hi. I don't know. Um, I think I'm going through a manic phase. Uh, in response to your talk tonight, I think uh, one of the biggest problems is that we are a nation of hypocrites. We may think we're the greatest people in the world, but we're, we're living in a bubble. And one of these days, we're going to burst. Um, in order to solve this problem, we can't solve it at the bottom. We have to start at the top. And that means you cut the head off the snake. Now, I don't think the snake starts with somebody like Trump. I'm not yeah. saying that he is one, but I think he's certainly affiliated with it. Um, yeah. Can you hear me now? Um, at any rate, so on, on that note, basically my reason that I'm talking tonight is that I watched the um, the hearing with Yovanovitch the other day, all day long, and um, 
I was very impacted by uh, her credentials and what she was trying to do and why Trump wanted her replaced to bring in the Three Stooges in order to set up kind of side deal with the gas uh, oil, uh, no, the gas, uh, some kind of racket with Giuliani. And, uh, you know, the fact that he has the right to, um, that people serve at, at his discretion, whatever. Um, pleasure, yes, pleasure is a great word. Um, that that really uh, uh, really got to me. Um, I mean, she was one of the most qualified people that I've ever heard speak in the house. And the thing that he has the audacity to just bump somebody out like she's some stooge on the apprentice <coughs> is is just beyond me. And I think you know what? I think it's time we change the rules in this country. Just because you get elected should not mean that you're entitled to take off these clowns and give them a position in our government. Yeah, yeah. We're paying for this. It's not the corporations, yeah. it's us, the little people. Yeah, and, yeah. and you know, and, 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 well, we're fighting. We got the Hatfields on one side and the McCoys on the other, and oh, I'm not going to vote Democratic, I'm not going to vote, oh, I hate those people, blah, blah, blah. And I mean, they're not even the problem. These people that are pulling the strings are, are the problem. And, and we, we're just too close to the metal down here, and we have to start watching what's going on, you know, up there in the cloud. Um, I, um, I had an, I, I don't know. I, I really believe that we have to change the rules. And I think that anybody who runs for public office ought to have some kind of a, a resume, some kind of qualifications, some kind of standards. Yes, Ben, that's a good word for it. I mean, you know, you can't, you can't get a fluffy job in the post office unless you take an exam and pass it. And now you take these people, and all they did was work on an election committee, and they, and, and, and they go off to mm -hmm. Ukraine and, uh, and do what, what they do. It has to stop. I mean, otherwise it's going to collapse just like all the casinos in, in in Russia? All right. New Jersey. New Jersey. All right. 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 All but I interacted with an adorable child in a way that I think the child liked, and the father and mother were there. I was going to give this thing to the child's uh, his mother, but she didn't take it. I said, isn't it something that I get in trouble trying to get the waitress to give me a soft drink and maybe another dessert? And be nice to an adorable child. I don't have a kid, and I got a smi not a smiling face, but a crying face. <coughs> I was at the meeting of the College of Complexes with me Saturdays with some interesting topics. I'm a major victim of this society. I deserve to be famous in all public games. I get in trouble for no good reason. Psychological mistreatment from professionals for over 50 years and police. You seem like you would be good friends to these people, except for the interference of the waitress and the man who may oh be the manager. God. If I get kicked out, I will try to get justice. So, and I was going to put my name and my phone number, but I don't want to get a lot of calls. I don't have an answering machine. So really, I'm one of the more mistreated people. You know, I say Negro on Caucasian, I'll tell you why. I can expect that you would be from Iceland. Darwin, that reflection makes your skin darker. I want to get people close. Ironically, since I'm so withdrawn, I have no friends. Here's where I use my 86 inch reach, which I couldn't dunk with. Here's where black and white are. Total opposite. Here's where New York's vacation is right here. It doesn't mean someone who should be a slave and someone who should be a slave owner. So I, I fantasize lecturing so I could do it better now. I discovered only recently that I really love to be with people. And I have no harmful inhibitions, but I have to not try to force myself. People generally have not backed off when I'm angry. So I have to go along to get along. But I wish I could write a book, but the school system damaged me. I don't love writing. So if the judge wanted to punish me, say, read War and Peace and write a book about it before you die. I'd say, well, uh, I know you're on it. It's a great book, but I don't think I can appreciate it. That's my, not my reason for being. So I've got this lecture that I have in me, but I hope it gets out there. But if I do live and die in obscurity, I hope the progress will happen anyway. And I would, my parents would have liked grandchildren from my sister and me. But we won't, we didn't give it to them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. so. All right, next. Thanks for sharing.
That's a hard act to follow. Um, only three minutes, so I want to contribute to the conversation. When I was a kid growing up, there was a family on the block. They had one kid who was like the angel, the other kid was the devil. And it was like, I was like, why are these so different? They're in the same family, the same males, have the same mom and dad. One of them is an asshole, the other guy's a saint. And I came up with the idea of differentiation. It's like when one person's growing up, and he looks at the other one and he says, you know what, I don't know what I am, but I'm not you, all right? And become someone else. Now, differentiation. African Americans, okay? They don't know who they are, but they're not white, okay? So, it's like, you see, you hear this thing, heard this thing in, on television, a kid was talking, and she said to another, another African American, why are you behaving white? And what she was talking about was going to school and studying, getting good grades, answering the questions, being quiet and everything. Why are you behaving white? I don't know what I am, but I'm not you. All right? Differentiation. Very tough one. Next thing we have is the violence. Okay? Take the, um, the problem with the opioids. The opioid problem seems to mostly affect uh, Caucasians. Okay? You don't have a lot of violence there. Not a lot of gunplay. A lot of people committing suicide, all right, with the drugs. Then you have the fact that illegal drugs are just as prevalent among white suburbanites as they are among black inner city kids, okay? But the white suburbanites don't do the violence, all right? They have the same problem, no violence, okay? Now you have this other thing going on. We had a solution, which was just get them a job, all right? Now, let's say we have this problem where it looks like what's missing from this group is a job, all right? But then we have this other thing. Most school shootings are committed by white kids in a school who have a job, don't need money, they're doing fine, all right? It's apparently the lack of jobs doesn't affect these kids who are shooting themselves with guns, or shooting their friends with guns, or shooting anybody around with guns. Teach it, teach it. Okay? So, I don't think that anything but personal responsibility, teaching people the golden rule, or right, living a sane life, is really going to affect society. It's like you don't have to have money. <laughs> We grew up poor, or I grew up poor, and it just never occurred to us not to go to work, not to save money, and it never occurred to us to be violent, you know? Um, it's a tough one. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I knew the rabbi before uh, he came here, and uh, he's not much of an egoist. You didn't uh, really try to draw up a big audience. I just briefly mentioned it to the, the other people. and and uh, But uh, everybody's tired from these demonstrations. Uh, I'm tired myself uh, from marching around the loop uh, uh, all afternoon. And, uh, uh, yeah, it, Trump is a, a big problem, but he's not the only problem. Um, the racism that's endemic in this society is a terrible, terrible thing. And uh, a, a third of the people in our jails might be innocent. I mean, that is a, uh, just such a badge of dishonor to this, to this country. Um, it's impossible to solve anything in three minutes. Um, I'm uh, obviously I'm an example of white privilege here. <laughs> I've been aware of it for a long time, but uh, when I grew up I 
uh, maybe had a little bit of guilt, but not so much awareness as uh, I've gotten over acquiring some more knowledge uh, by just getting older. <clears throat> um, religion, uh, religion sometimes is part of the problem because so many religionists are racists. Um, and we're getting displayed. They came out of the woodwork with Trump. I mean, that's really what it was. They were kind of they they weren't they didn't feel empowered um, so much. And so so we found out we found out what you know uh, the symptoms. But we are. It's going to take so much time and unraveling of the evil that's been occurring to get at some of the causes and. And, uh, and the rabbi is trying hard, uh, and he's, he's even going, he's even got somebody he's mentoring in India there, which is amazing. Um, uh, he's, uh, he's trying to uplift people, and uh, uh, that's a good word I've been trying to use. I mean, that we have to do everything we can to uplift others. Um, you, know, you might not be able to do any of the ones that are evil. I, I, um, I had... Um, um, the opportunity, I worked with a not-for-profit for a while, which is now moribund, uh, the, the, the founder died. Um, she was pretty old, but she had convinced me to try uh, to go into the inner city, and I was teaching kids uh, Shakespeare and science uh, as a sideline. I even went to working uh, night, the night shift so I could do that during the day, like two or three days a week. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but it, it seems like a drop in the bucket. I thought about things like that, um, that you know, after-school programs and uh, you know, revamping the the warehouses and it, and it and uh, the other lady I don't know your name, uh, but the, to bring up the red tape, the the red tape, the city. I mean, and can't somebody do something about the fact that if, if you're trying to do something? You run into all of these stupid red tape problems. So I remember uh, um, that, that it was only by the luck that this other individual had set up a not-for-profit years ago, and so I, I replaced somebody that she lost. He, he went to Arizona or something, and uh, and uh, just was a happenstance, and uh, and that was something positive. I got some. It was funny. I mean, sometimes you'd go to the supermarket and. Uh, a kid would run into you and say how much he appreciated the, uh, what you did, uh, the, the little amount that I, I went in there to teach. Uh, uh, anyway, um, we all just have to try to do what we can, and thank you, Rabbi, for, for doing so much. What's your up there? Got a quick yeah, just a quick announcement. Um, the National Alliance Against Racist Political Oppression is, has a conference on the 22nd, 23rd, 24th, next week. Sorry, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. It's just $25 for the whole weekend, um, or free if you need it. But Angela Davis will be there kicking it off. They're reforming the National Alliance, what it was 46 years ago. And, um, you know, it's just been in Chicago the last 45 years actively. But it should be great. Uh, a lot of breakout sessions, learning about organizing. I'm going to give you a special uh, yeah, thing. Thanks. It'd be great if you're there. Yeah. yeah. Very okay. Very good. Thank you. All right. All right. Let's, uh, let's thank our speaker again. Thank you for what you're doing. Uh, thank you for your uh, multitude multiple activities uh, for the good of the community. <laughs> um, and uh, please come again, tell us, uh, give us an update on progress that you're making uh, towards arriving at a solution to the problems you've selected or focused on. Uh, the thing, I'll be rather concise here, there's a common element, there's a thing in mathematics called the common denominator in fractions. Everybody kind of knows that. A common oh, yeah. common element, you have, you have different things. You have violence against women. You have uh, significant confrontations with the police, violent confrontations with the police. And then you had uh, uh, convictions for uh, homicides. Well, the common element of all that is a weapon. It's a gun. And all these wonderful things, approaches, uh, 
jobs, what have you, are just peripheral. Cosmetic, uh, ephemeral uh, aspects of the central problem, which is violence that's made possible by the possession and proliferation of guns and the use of guns. I've heard earlier something about there should be widespread gun training for, I guess, accuracy of using weaponry, which is counterproductive, I guess, unless, you know. Uh, and I'm sorry, sir, this conspiracy theory that the police are responsible for the distribution of guns in a community mm -hmm. carries little or no weight with me. I, you're not. From a railroad background, that, theft, that that these weapons are obtained through intermodal trains, um, and as a matter of fact, probably more trains sort of come through the west and the north side portions of the city than the south side. Um, as a railroad man, so that is that surprised me. I. I didn't know, you know, your figures there. So that is is not a addressing the issue. Now you've got to if there's it's very simple. It's not complex. If there's no guns, there's no gun violence. And the other ones fall in line as well. Um, the and the other thing is, Gene, I if they want to put a police academy in my neighborhood, they're welcome to. I was really happy when they put a police station right where my bus stop is. That was a really nice location, I thought. <laughs> the very spot where I have to wait for a bus is the entrance to the police station. I can't think of a better location, but no, we have to train our personnel it's, listen, this is, being a policeman is, is nothing here. They have other training facilities. Come on, they've got even training facilities for crossing guards. <laughs> uh, you've got trained personnel. This is a responsible thing. And you, you have to have ongoing training. They're not just one-time one, one deals. We have, like, the union that I'm affiliated with, we have an academy, the training center. I've been there probably 14 times on rigorous courses over the years. So it's ongoing updating, training, things of that nature. And this is how you address issues in the force. Uh, it's a common meeting ground and uh, requiring certain personnel to take certain refresher courses, ongoing things like that. It's probably a very good investment if you want a good if you want a good workforce, you're going to have to invest in it. But anyhow, it's come again when you got another one. Thank you very much for an excellent presentation. All right, thank you. Hi, Justin. Um, I uh, thought it was interesting that. Uh, talk of taking away, you know, we have to get rid of the weapons, but the cops, I want, please build a cop academy right by my place, seems a little bit hypocritical or dissonant to hate weapons, but welcome people who carry them. I would presume people of, of that uh, frame of mind only think that cops should have weapons, which uh, if the cops are committing a bunch of crimes, them yeah. only having having the weapons seems pretty silly and dangerous. I, I think the only I think I'm sure there's a lot of uh, well-intentioned folks who are for gun control, but there's also a lot of people who uh, have sympathies for folks like Joseph Stalin and Vladimir Lenin, and I think they want to use gun control as a means to uh, take over, yeah. take over uh, and enslave wow. humanity. I know. I think Charlie is of this crowd. Uh, I'm not sure. That's not a personal attack. I think that's just an objective observation. Um, 
So uh, I think he, I think as a student of, of communism, I think he's, his authoritarian tendencies come out, and uh, this is just another manifestation of that. Uh, the reason why I think it's good to have gun ownership is so we can kill communists. Thank you. Oh. We're going to get a chance to get the final one. Um, okay. okay. It looks like that's the end of the rebuttal period tonight. Uh, our speaker will get the last word. Uh, one 20 second comment. It uh, doesn't matter what kind of training you have if you're watching a guy strangle somebody on the street and kill him when he's unarmed. That's not a question of training, that's a question of the rest of us standing by watching somebody murder somebody else. Silence means consent. We've been silent too long as a nation. All of us, all different colors, we're silent while this racism and killing is going on. It's just wrong and it's got to stop. Thank you. If we have time, I'd like to All right, give him one last. Trying to keep Are you pro gun? All right. Thank you again, Rabbi. Um, so, in no particular order, uh, now, we actually did have Trumpism lead to uh, some sort of dystopian right-wing dictatorship in the future. I know that people on the left would be screaming to have access to rocket launchers and not just handguns. Um, but that's a counterfactual. Like, that's an actual example from World War II. The resistance didn't just go around with a strongly worded letter to the New York Times uh, fighting in Eastern Europe. Um, I was sorry that I didn't get through Q&A to ask the rabbi about the history of your organization. Uh, I was familiar with uh, the movement led by Michael Lerner. Uh, with some roots in sort of the 1960s and 70s new left and his magazine Tikkun, but obviously he doesn't have a patent on using this concept from Judaism. I didn't know if you had an organization that was mostly converts or uh, what other political and social movements might have been in the background, but I appreciated the focus on uh, criminal justice issues, even if some of the individual claims, I agree with Charlie on this one, something about the the freight train story sounded a little off to me because one of the commonly repeated things about how guns come in is people just get them in Indiana and then drive yeah. over, you know, across state lines with them. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm worried about the future uh, of the next generation of politics in part because of the long-term social and political changes, and this is why, yeah, even though I think you know, Trump is malevolent, he is product as much as cause of this change, um, as there's uh, going to be an increasing amount of white backlash, I think, as we approach a white minority United States. And I'm not looking forward to that, but you can already tell sort of with birtherism and Trumpism, the circling of the wagons that's taking place in that form. And I think as the white population of the U.S. falls below 50%, that rhetoric could become even sharper, yep. unfortunately. Um, and, you know, we watched a long-term decline from when George Wallace was running for president back in the 60s and 70s to when Pat Buchanan was president. And then, does anyone even remember when Tom Tancredo ran on basically Trump's platform and I had to look it up whether it was 2008 or 2012, but it was all border and deportations, and I couldn't even remember what year the guy ran. That's how little of a splash he made. And now we've got, you know, the great orange dragon in the White House. Um, and there are parallels to this all over, um, in, as I say here many times when I come, including in Western Europe. Uh, it's going to get ugly, and we're going to keep being ugly for decades ahead. Anyway, thank you. All right. Just a quick reminder to all you guys about a quote from that infamous leader, Mao Zedong. Political power is best achieved through the end of a barrel of a gun. <laughs> what did he say? Oh, that's not very These are private handguns. That's an army. Uh, so I'm going to make them again. Um, I appreciate all of the those rebuttals. I will try to uh, remember a lot of them. Uh, some that I kind of need to address. 
particularly with the, my my uh, theory with regards to <coughs> the guns uh, that come into Chicago and in the hands of strong <coughs> individuals. Uh, are we seeing um, the Chicago Police Department <coughs> has not been guilty of planting drugs on our beach? Are we saying that the police department has not been guilty of putting guns in cars and then arresting our people and saying they are dead, they did it. I can point to many examples of where the Chicago Police Department has been guilty of planting several of my people and getting away with murder. So what gets this situation of my claim or a theory that these automatic weapons that gets into the society of our community, what gives them that much leeway that they don't have anything to do with that? I believe that the Chicago Police Department has something to do with regards to bringing the guns in the hands of my people. Uh, because I cannot, uh, 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 I cannot ignore uh, the history uh, what this Chicago Police Department has been, the, the nature of having its uh, uh, consistent patterns of racially cleansing the people of color for so, quite some time. Uh, do you all remember Rakia Boyd, who was murdered by Dante Servant? Do we remember um, the gentleman uh, that killed Quan McDonald, uh, Jason Van Dyke? Do we remember of all the different police uh, uh, individuals who have taken upon themselves to do the exact same thing of what the lynching during the time of the uh, the beginning of the progressive times of when this country began to progress further? Uh, the lynching of our people was a clear example of what we've seen in the streets just recently. Um, this Last couple of days ago, I mentioned Rakia Boyd for a reason, because I advocated for uh, on that issue as well. I didn't have that in my slide. But this recently, Dante Sermon rose from the dead. No one knows. Dante Sermon, the one that murdered Rakia Boyd, surfaced four, four years later ago. He come back to go into this city before the judge in 26 of California and to advocate that his record be expunged regardless of the fact what he is responsible for. And you know he said in his, his claim, he said in his paperwork that he filed in the courts that he's suffering from postpartum stress. Well, I beg to differ. What is the family suffering from right now? They're, they're suffering from long-term, lifelong stress of having their daughter be removed from this world because of him. I beg to differ that he suffers from any stress when it comes to the family that is going to have, these holidays that's coming up are going to have an empty chair at their gathering. So it's a bit of hypocrisy that this Chicago Police Department and all the way it does and stands for, uh, that we will give uh, the benefit of the doubt to this police department, it mind boggles me that we will give them the, this much leeway of not saying they are not capable of bringing guns to my people. I make the difference in many cases of planting drugs on my people. I see many cases planting uh, guns on my people and having them be racially cleansed in the system and make faulty reports to get our people stand before the judge and give them long sentences. So I just want to go ahead and just give that part. Uh, uh, the other things that you guys asked for, my, my organization started, is 2019 this year. We, oh, we launched this year, May 5th. Um, please, it was, it was more like uh, a, um, a dream of mine to do the continuation of the work I've done all over the place. I work with several organizations. Uh, uh, mass incarceration, I work with refuge fascism, I work with uh, an international uh, uh, federation. Um, there, there's several organizations I work with, a uh, SWAP, I work with uh, eight, uh, the, the eight uh, several organizations. Okay, so, give us your website and how somebody can get in touch with sure. you.
Uh, my website is www.tikkunchai.org. My email is admin, A-D-M-I-N, at tikkunchai.org. Uh, reach me on there. Um, I'm, I have several other. These are not going that I advocate for. Again, I advocate for uh, 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 global warming. As, you, as I said to you earlier, the reason why the earth is there is because my first paper in college was on global warming. So I have a love and compassion for the earth and the earth that the, we, the only earth that we have uh, at, at this time that we must make sure that it stays uh, healthy and not be destroyed through fossil fuels and through carbon, uh, all those things that human man is responsible for. So I thank you all for having me. This has been a blast. I can, I, I'm, I'm so uh, happy there's a, a group here I can come and sit down and hear good ideas and uh, just bounce around things. So I, 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 I want to thank Where's Charles, Charles at. Right here. Charles, thank you very much, sir. All right, thank you, sir. I, I, I'm very, very appreciative. Right. So God bless and keep you all. I mean, all my bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that's it for uh, the Galaxy Complex tonight. We'll see you all next Saturday and we're adjourned.